our next session future ready investing in future defense technologies the only constant they say is change and no field is changing as fast as the defense sector when newer technologies like hypersonic weapons artificial intelligence and drones promise to change the face of warfare what are the cutting edge technologies that india should be looking at to protect itself from this new arms race joining me in my next panel discussion are dr g satish reddy chairman drdo secretary department of defense research and development mr baba kalyani chairman and managing director bharat forge limited and lieutenant general p ravi shankar former director general artillery and presently professor department of aerospace at iit madras hello and welcome to the india today defense conclave where we debate the issues facing india as it embarks on its twin path of modernization and indigenization without uh, much ado i want to uh, invite uh, dr satish reddy to speak about the technologies that india should be investing in for the future to ensure that we stay ahead of the curve dr satish reddy over to you sir thank you uh, very much uh, sandeep punita uh, for uh, giving this opportunity to give my some of my views and ideas and also to share this uh, platform with uh, uh, baba kalyani ji and general shankar with whom we have been uh, we have worked and we have been working with them also the today when you look at uh, generally india has been a technology follower i always say this we have been seeing that elsewhere in the world some technologies are developed and some product comes out and some equipment comes out and then you also come to know about it and you start working on that you develop the technology and then you develop the product and then yes you say that we also have developed what has been the generally the trend till now so i keep saying that from technology follower you have to become a technology leader this <clears throat> is one of the important thing so you need to identify many technologies which are emerging today and which you have to work on them and make sure that uh, that you are able to develop those technologies to do that what is your actually core strength and where you have already got developed many strengths is one thing you need to look at yourself and then also look for those uh, technologies which are coming so firstly when you look at the technologies today i think the indian uh, defense uh, whole ecosystem has come up very well in developing many of the missile systems many of the radar systems many of the electronic warfare systems many of the torpedoes uh, many of the avac systems and uh, today we are talking about sonars we are also talking about guns and we are also talking about uh, combat vehicles and communication systems and all that these are some of the things which you have actually developed and now also you have entered into the area of the spectrum of developing the fighter aircraft and also some submarines ship building and other uh, related activities but when you look at the trends that are coming up in the today when you look at one is very important thing is in the missiles uh, domain you are talking about hypersonic missiles you are talking about hypersonic glide vehicles and all that is one of the very important areas which are coming up then we are talking about the radars you are talking about very long range radars you are talking about over the horizon radio radars and sky wave radars and things like that is another area where it is coming and talking about radars like photonics radars with gallium nitride technology and the various phase array radars and all that is one of the very important areas similarly you are talking about very high electromagnetic pulse electromagnetic energy talking about laser powers laser energy you are talking about terahertz technologies talking about materials which are very lightweight and which are high temperature high strength materials is another area which is very very important for anything which you have to look into it uh, then you are talking about high uh, energy propellants high energy materials they are actually your uh, when you talk about range for a given fixed range for a given fixed payload what is the weight you can have what is the minimum weight what you can have compared to any world standard is one of the parameters what you need to look at and similarly on the other side when you talk about you are talking about lightweight most modern new generation tanks we are talking about guns are automatic yes the country has uh, achieved the world's longest range gun which uh, 
Bharat Forge is a partner to that, and uh, we, Bharat Forge and Tata, have uh, together worked on it and developed it. But then there are lightweight guns and with much better ammunition, guided shells. Talking about in the aircrafts, you need to definitely look at uh, uh, aircrafts like a uh, 50 generation plus aircraft, which are stealth aircraft like AMPA is one of the technologies which we need to develop. Then most importantly, today we are talking about cyber side. Cyber security is one of the important things. Cyber and space are the fourth and fifth dimensions of warfare. Cyber, we need to develop a lot of skill set in the country, lots of youngsters we need to attract them, and a lot of startups need to come up in that area. Firstly, talking about cyber defense and if required, cyber offensive. So these are all some of the areas where we need to concentrate in the advanced technologies areas. And uh, all of us working together, particularly the academia, working on basic research to applied research. The laboratories like us working on applied research to translation research and the industry taking from translation research to the product uh, and producing them with a sustained quality and also having a research in the niche. That what we are looking for is the industry should be able to develop many of the things with the uh, technologies based which have been developed in the country as a BTS items, built to specification items, then the laboratories can concentrate more and more on advanced research and come out with the new and newer products and newer technologies is one thing. So this is the way, actually, if you can work on that and work on these technologies, you are not lagging behind the advanced nations and uh, which are coming out with advanced and futuristic products. You also will be able to come out with those products in the similar timelines. We have done this in some of the areas. We are one of the fourth nation, one of the fifth nation, one of the sixth nation in development of many of the advanced technologies. Yes, that domain has to expand a lot. Second thing is we need to see that our indigenous content, which is roughly about uh, around close to 50% is the indigenous content in the armed forces. That has to go to a much higher value, more than 80 to 90% of the value. For that, whatever technologies which we are lagging, the gap is there. Those technologies have to be focused and also to be developed in the country so that we don't import, whereas we become exporter of this technology. That is what we need to work together, all the three elements in the ecosystem of defense. Right. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Dr. Reddy. I'm going to bring in uh, Mr. Baba Kalyani, who's been listening to what you just said. Uh, you know, the, uh, Mr. Kalyani is, as I said earlier, has, uh, you know, made some very interesting investments in the defense space, um, yeah, particularly in the areas of uh, artillery guns and in land systems. Over a decade ago, when people were not even willing to invest any money in the defense sector. So, Mr. Kalyani, could you tell us uh, how you see, uh, you know, what Dr. Reddy mentioned, the fact that we need to invest in all these emerging technologies. As, as someone from the private sector, uh, how do you approach this? I mean, what are the kind of areas that you see this civil military fusion that we were talking of earlier happening. I honestly think there is a new direction that DRDO has got now. And the policies uh, of the government, the Honorable Prime Minister, this whole concept of Atmanirbhar Bharat is uh, playing out very, very well. You know, when we, are, when we have institutions like the DRDO developing all these advanced technologies, you also need, as you said, uh, translation of these technologies and research into production. Now that's where we come in uh, as industry to translate, uh, uh, you know, technologies and research into production, and not just uh, production in terms of make it to print, but also add some value and add some knowledge and keep uh, innovating and keep making it better and better, so that the intellectual property resides with us, and we become a nation that can export high-end products in. Uh, uh, the defense and aerospace uh, field. Uh, Dr. Reddy mentioned about ATAC. You know, we are one of the partners uh, involved in building this gun. And, you know, we have uh, in, in this gun, it's 100% indigenous. Even the electronics we have developed uh, locally using uh, uh, partners uh, within the industry uh, area, some uh, people from MSME sector, some people, some technocrats, uh, so it's amazing uh, in terms of what capability exists in this country. What I see happening uh, uh, in India, if you, if you were to put the clock forward by another five, six years, is all these technologies that are being developed for uh, defense and aerospace 
will have tremendous spin-offs in other sectors. You know, a lot of these technologies are dual-use technologies. They also get used in the civilian sector, whether it's automotive, whether it's industrial sector, whether it's the machinery sector, they will all get used in this sector. And India's technology base and capability will dramatically expand. I mean, it'll expand, in my opinion, in the next seven to 10 years, it, should, it will expand 10x with this uh, approach that we have we are taken now. Some of the products that he mentioned, uh, you know, in terms of, uh, uh, let's say, jet engines uh, required for uh, futuristic uh, fighter aircrafts. I mean, today, I think that's one technology that uh, uh, this country has not mastered yet, and it needs to get mastered because it's an important, uh, important technology. If you look at the statement that uh, uh, China made just a few days ago, I'm sure uh, you have also seen that somewhere. You know, it has, uh, last Thursday, matter of fact, it has vowed to build uh, the fully modern army by 2027 and move towards technology self-sufficiency and meet all its development go uh, goals. And this, if you, if you read with the backdrop of uh, Made in China 2025, where they have listed all the technology uh, verticals that they want to master, you know, they have a goal. And I think we have, uh, we need to set similar goals. Uh, if India has to stay relevant in the emerging new world order, we need to have, uh, just like what our armed forces are doing on the borders today and showing their capability, we need every citizen in this country, every organization in this country needs to get up and create the force that is capable of multiplying itself using the technology that is developed within the country. And I think we have immense capabilities uh, here. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Kalyani. Thanks for those thoughts. And I want to bring in, without any uh, delay, I want to bring General Ravi Shankar in uh, to give us the user's perspective on just what you've heard. You've heard the designer, you've heard the manufacturer. Now, could you give us a user's perspective of how you see the uh, battlefield of the future. What is the future battlefield going to look like? What do the Indian Armed Forces have to be ready for? What I'll do is, whatever they've said, I'll put it in the operational context. In what's happening and what's to happen ahead. So I'll put it in the form of a slide show. Uh, you'll have to bear with me. Let, at the outset, let me say, are we future ready? Not as it. Do we, are we investing in future defense technology? Yes. At the same time, I might also like to say that the fact that we've been able to hold China on a leash in the Eastern Ladakh with the technologies which we have, which are not less, speaks volumes of what our base is. And we need to go ahead. That's a given. But then what is the you know, scenario in which we're going to go ahead? That is the issue which we have to look at. Today is a area or the era of the multi-domain warfare that's happening today right old domains of air land and sea are there but like what dr reddy spoke space cyberspace nuclear electromagnetic spectrum energy and resources of course politics ideology economy these are all kicked in public opinion legal and influence operations all these are technology driven heavily and this war is going to be happening in peace and uh, no, no peace conditions day and night by multiple actors, non-state actors and what have you. The last generation, we spoke of revolution in military affairs during the Gulf Wars. But today, a whole lot of disruptive technologies which have already been spoken have come up. That's what in the center in the blue. Right. And what we're looking at ahead is something called disruption in military affairs. Military affairs are being disrupted as never before. Never in my life have I seen how things are changing. Okay, so what if? Let's see how do you correlate these disruptive uh, technologies with lessons from Ladakh. When I thought over it, I felt, look, in Ladakh, we needed battlefield transparency. So what is it? transfer into technology. It looks You look at space, you look at GIS, you look at manned, unmanned system, you need to look at uh, night vision sensors and so on. You need reach, range. Uh, the Dr. Reddy's did speak about it. That means you need new propulsion technologies, 
you need manned and unmanned systems, control and guidance technologies of the latest variety. Precision, very important. As you reach farther, you need precision. That's how cost advantage kicks in. But then there's a technology requirement of terminal guidance. You need seekers, AI. AI is going to be all pervasive in most of the systems tomorrow. You need space. Again, it reappears. So many of these technologies start reappearing. You need technologies for designation and acquisition. Networks, very important. Today, we have already entered the era of networks. Already some of our uh, fire control systems are networked. Then, then are you looking at communications? Do you want 5G or you want to stick to 4G? Something like, you know, why do you want to have something futuristic when something, what is there today can work well? Fiber optics, cyber tech, AI again, energy. Energy is something which I think we have to look at very seriously. Battlefield requirement of energy is going to be huge in tomorrow's domains of warfare, any warfare. You, you very seriously have to look at renewables, fuel cell technologies. You know, energy requirements are both for ground systems and for living, even there. Then, what about mobility? In terms of lightweight materials, the infrastructure which you need on our border areas, you, you're going to have different technology altogether. You can't divest yourself away from that kind of technology for infrastructure in the border areas. Permafrost technologies, quick setters, I mean, the words are just, these are all indicators, but I think you need, we need to do quite a bit. It's not that as if we are not doing it, but are we doing it in a focused manner? That's the issue. We need to focus. It's not as if the technology is not there, right? Then survivability. We, look, we need individual production, collective production, medical technologies. Very huge. How are you going to get these medical technologies up at 16 to 17,000 feet? We can never forget that most of our battlefields tomorrow are going to be in the Himalayan region. There's no choice but to fight at 16 to 20,000 feet, whether it's in the north or in the east. And then, of course, weapon protection. Weapons have to survive in these conditions. So this is, all these issues make, you know, I've just converted all those disruptive technologies into fields where they are applicable. Okay. Now what, how do you apply it to the ground? You know, you have the Air Force, Navy, and the Army, I've split it, with their systems already, right? They're there. The weapon systems are there. You can't throw them away. You're going to upgrade them. You're going to in make them, energize them, or get to new systems. That's a trade-off, whether you want to upgrade or hold on to the new systems. Now, sorry. Yeah. Now, all these systems... All the technologies which I've, I've spoken of have come up. Now, if you want to increase, say, the range of artillery, you have to look at propulsion technology. Once you have propulsion, you need navigation technology, sensors. Then you need sensors, you need precision. Once you have all this, then you have to start looking at ISR technology, network, cyber, AI. And if you've done all this and put together for one system in the artillery, you might, you'll have to replicate it for the Navy and the Air Force. This is just for one system. Then you look at so many other systems. So it's a many-to-many -many uh, you know, environment in which we have to work. So you need to rethink the whole story. Okay, how do you do that? Right? I think the time has come to put the services as the pivot of procurement. Right? Like what uh, Dr. Satish Reddy said. He said, look, academia, DRDO, industry, have to work together on a triangular system. The MOD has to support the whole story. They cannot be out of it, right? But the services have to drive it because it is they and they alone who will be able to tell us how to do it. And unless services own this uh, whole story, nothing is going to move forward. Okay, but then there is something called the civil military fusion. China has gone into civil military fusion in a big way in the past, say, about a decade or two. But much before that, in the last century, it was USA who started this whole story of civil military fusion. When you look at civil military fusion, you have to you know, widen the whole story. You have to get into ISRO, you got to go to DAE, you go to METI, you have to get the industry, you have to get to CSR labs, everyone. And I think we need to start talking as a nation a different story. We can't hear, you know, we, 
when you're looking at these emerging technologies and these disruptive technologies, we have to think in a different dimension altogether. Solar, making India self-reliant in ammunition. I want to ask um, uh, Dr. Reddy the first question based on what he had spoken and, of course, based on what uh, General Ravi Shankar just presented. What are the technologies that uh, you think that are going to be really critical in the years ahead given our security scenario and given the fact that as you mentioned yourself, there are many technologies that the DRDO would have to partner with uh, the industry to go forward, that there were technologies that you had identified where the DRDO would not look at, it would leave it entirely to the private sector. What is this new philosophy that you've brought into the DRDO in the last couple of months, uh, given the larger aim of Atmanirbhar Bharat and of course this, uh, the fact that we have to prepare for these uh, new technologies that uh, General Ravi Shankar mentioned. ARDO, we have come out with many things which we are actually uh, working on today. Firstly, industry, we have got them as DCPP, Development Come Production Part. That means if I take up a project, any, let's say, radar development or a torpedo development or a missile development, day one, the industry joins as a partner. And we'll be working together, and industry is part and parcel of it and industry works with us in the development, automatically the knowledge is automatically is passed on and shared. And if the first development model which we'll be testing will be coming from the industry. This is one important thing which we have worked with the services. The new defense acquisition policy, we have brought down the time scales, the time what is required for the trials, drastically at least by about four times or five times. They said there will be one trial which is actually a unified trial of development and user trial because the production agency is there already involved and they're going to do that. This is one of the important things and there is, uh, as General Shankar mentioned, which is an integrated effort what is required. EMTs will be the giant uh, management teams which are services, DRDO, industry, and the quality assurance agencies together will be participating in these things and taking the decisions on this part. In fact, if we work together, there's nothing. The speed at which this country can do is enormous. Number two, we have made our test facilities completely open to the industry today. And third, technology transfers, we have made it very, very, very simple. We are also actually have made our patents open to the industry. Complete patents were made. We have also created a technology development fund for all the imported parts which are coming today. If some industry is able to indigenize, we are funding them more than 90% of the cost of that is completely from here. So this is what we have brought working with industry. Similarly with academia, we have already opened centers of excellence. IIT Chennai is one, IIT Delhi is one. We are working on the most advanced technologies, what I have mentioned some time back. We are working with the academia. We are today working with about 295 academic institutes spending about roughly 1,000 crores with the academia. Recently, uh, the Mantri has promulgated our defense uh, DRDO's procurement manual. Lots of things facilitating industry we have brought in there, which industry will be able to use it. Like we had some 10% uh, deposit, uh, which the industry has to put in right in the beginning. We have removed that now. Similarly, when we give a material as a free issue of material to them to manufacture certain things, used to have a bank guarantee. We have removed that. We are actually uh, going through a uh, insurance. Actually, DRD will be paid, not the industry. 
So likewise, lots of things have been made. You asked me there actually what are the major technology focus uh, things. If you talk about for any nation, particularly looking at the difference and all that, two most important things are very, very, very important. The country should be actually self-sufficient in the materials. Materials, you should be self-sufficient, not be actually uh, strategically dependent on somebody and then somebody stops and you are off. One thing what the country has done. Second is the advanced manufacturing technology should be available in the country. Without advanced and innovative manufacturing uh, uh, capabilities in the country, you will never be able to compete with the world. And I want to bring in uh, uh, Mr. Kalyani in because what you mentioned actually has, um, you know, a lot of uh, implications when you, you spoke about manufacturing, for instance, and the fact that we need to actually make the machines that uh, make these uh, cutting edge uh, technologies and the fact that we need to be self-sufficient in them. Uh, Mr. Kalyani, you know, as someone who took this uh, leap of faith many years back, uh, you know, uh, 10 years back, without any orders, you went out of your way and you invested in a gun line uh, in, in land systems without any orders. Uh, a, how does this new defense policy, the new Akhmedirvan slogan and the policy that has been put out by the government, what is your uh, reaction to it as, as an industrialist? And secondly, what are the kind of investments that uh, you are prepared to make now in the years ahead based on what uh, Dr. Reddy just spoke? You know, first of all, I think uh, uh, as far as the government policy is concerned, uh, Defense uh, and aerospace was the first area where we got a defined policy in terms of what will be procured indigenously. So we had, uh, you know, a few months ago, this list of 101 items that came out, uh, artillery being one of them, uh, which said from next year, there will be no imports of this product. And then ERDO came out with a list of 108 uh, subsystems uh, where industry was encouraged to make all this because these also would not be imported. I think. This is, this is the kind of policy that you really need because you it, it creates clarity, it creates uh, your direction, and then as an entrepreneur, as a business, you're ready to invest. Of course, we made the investment much before because, you know, we were, I, I mean, we were passionate about it, and we felt that uh, just like what we did in our, in our normal forging business uh, in 1991, uh, we made huge investments to convert uh, a very high level of, I mean, from simple technology to a very high level of technology using brain power rather than muscle power. And we betted on the world uh, to create uh, ourselves uh, demand from the world market. Similarly, you know, artillery is one product where with the technology that DRDO and its research centers have and the kind of manufacturing skills that people like us have. I mean, in our artillery plant, the entire system is made digit digitally. Okay, there is, it's a paperless system. Everything is on screens. You have a PLM system that can trace every nut, bolt, item through from where it has come. So it's an amazing system which helps you get high quality and reduce costs at the same time. And I think today Indian manufacturing has this capability to do this. We did a similar thing with uh, DRDO with, with their lab in Pune, ARD, to create this uh, uh, kinetic energy ammunition for the Arjun tank. And in the first shot, it was fired in Balasur and it was absolutely okay. And, you know, we are we are hoping that we can work uh, and do something even better. Uh, we got a penetration of some 515 odd millimeters. I think probably Dr. Reddy's target is to cost 600 millimeters in this area. But, you know, it's amazing what you can do when you work together. I'm very, very confident that India will see a tremendous resurgence coming out of, you know, technology and the innovations that come out of technology. And a lot of this is going to come from defense and aerospace. Not all of it, but a lot of it is going to come from defense and aerospace. I want to bring in uh, General Ravi Shankar here at this point. Based on what you spoke about the technologies that we need to be looking at, uh, the Indian Army, uh, you know, to me, it, it strikes me as a very interesting organization in the sense that it lives in many centuries at the same time. You have mules, you have bayonets, you have tanks, howitzers, and drones and future systems. How do you reconcile all of these 
uh, with given the speed of procurements and the fact that you have limited budgets, uh, you know, as a, as an army, as a former army man, how do you uh, see this happening? I mean, would you, for instance, the army is one of the largest buyers of bayonets uh, and indeed mules and tanks. So, how do you bring this new uh, element of uh, you know hypersonic weapons or just uh, unmanned aerial systems? Uh, I mean, would you? reduce the number of uh, tanks and guns and go in for these cutting edge systems how does how does one change mindsets right that's a very interesting question and i'll answer it in different manners uh, the first thing is the terrain at which we work many of these technologies don't work there i mean there's technology has gone ahead but it doesn't work there it's simple that's the fundamental and it's just not our lack of technology or inability to take the technology to these heights uh, and conditions which matter. It, it's, it's the same the other side. In fact, today, if you ask me, China is worse off, technology-wise, in Eastern Ladakh. And it's telling on them. Right. Now, having said this, where does technology come in in these areas? Technology comes in. Like when you have extended reach, when you have precision, you have good communication and everything, you are able to deter the enemy. So technology comes in to deter the enemy to hold him off at that farther level. So this is the dichotomy, the terrain versus the thing. And that is why you will still, you, for the next half century or more, we have to live with nukes, we have to live with hypersonic systems or rather aspire for hypersonic systems and you know find our balance in between somewhere so that is something which we have to do the next thing which is very interesting which is happening all over are these disruptive technologies you know ai robotics cyber ar vr new materials space gis now, these are getting integrated with the normal armed forces okay for example, yesterday I got an input from Eastern Ladakh about the state of equipment out there. Uh, it's enabled through space after all, right? Uh, 5G or I mean, not, if not 5G, 4G or whatever. So it's going to come in. But the more interesting part is these technologies, you know, uh, two, a year back, this issue we spoke in a seminar where about 2,000 army officers were attending, you know, that seminar. They said, how do you ingest these technologies into the armed forces? Which is the way? And the unanimous answer would, of all these 2,000 people was, it has to be through startups. So we need a very robust startup, uh, you know, kind of ecosystem. And that is something which I am not yet seeing in India. Uh, just to give you... A, idea the ai programs for the you know us army the entire program is being run out of carnegie mellon university right entire and they've funded about 3.5 billion dollars for it there the reason is simple these technologies are being executed and made by young minds people like us are old Right, and you have to go to them and get this technology from the grassroots level. If you don't do it, someone else will take it. Again, I'll give you an example. I had a student of mine who had incorporated AI into a small drone, which did some recognition, which did counting and everything. Personally, I thought it was a fantastic piece of innovation. So I took it to the Army Design Bureau. I took it to NDMA. I took it to a number of people, right? And everyone pointed a finger at the other guy. Because, you know, the realization and the potential of this is not there. So finally, I said, okay. But someone did help me out and we started realizing things. Till one day, this boy, he just put one slide and sent it to Microsoft. One week later, Microsoft sends him a ticket to come to Seattle. All expenses paid. He goes and presents this in Seattle. Right? And then Microsoft says, tell me, what do you want? Come and do this, develop this into a system here. That's the approach. That's the difference in approach. 
that's what i was saying unless we break our own mindsets unless we break our own structures unless we place uh, unless we place faith in technology we'll go nowhere why do you think what dr reddy said one within one year we could come out with a guided pinata faith you know what he told me he said look jana shankar you will lead this project take it where you want everyone is with you that's it every month i was in hyderabad listening to a young set of people talking of things which i couldn't understand but i was there with them and they made it happen okay this is the involvement which we need from the entire ecosystem if that happens nothing can stop india it can happen we just have to take responsibility if your structures are thinking changes the world is our oyster the world is our oyster and, and what an excellent note to end this uh, fascinating discussion I, i want to thank uh, you all for your time thank you all for being here i know you have extremely busy schedules thank you for taking your time out 